Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're having a great time today. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. But we have a special show today. It's the 25th anniversary of Mid-American Gardener and we have a specially lovely studio, live studio audience here. Yay! We have spent most of the day together and we've had a great time. So nice studio audience. We love the energy. We also have lovely panelists. So let's find out who they are and their expertise. Well, hello this evening. I am Teresa Mears. I am a teacher at Parkland College for horticulture. And I really enjoy propagation and spending time in the greenhouse. So ask away. I'm a Vermilion County, John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. And if it's green and growing, I probably like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Sandy Mason I'm with the University of Illinois Extension and for 30 years I was a horticulture educator and now I'm the state master gardener coordinator and I pretty much like all the green stuff too but I particularly like native plants, pollinators, all kinds of great stuff. Very good. It's going to be a great show. And now our first question we're going to go to one of our studio audience members, Pamela. Hi. Uh, I've just uh, returned to Urbana after living in California for 47 years. That's the breaking news. Uh, <laughs> on the West Coast, everyone uses the Sunset Gardening book uh, as their go-to gardening Bible. And um, is there a comparable guide to Midwest gardening? Uh, I'm especially interested in gardening with native plants. Uh, I checked my Western garden book, and there wasn't even an entry for pawpaw. So I know it's not universal. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I uh, brought along some show and tells of some of our nice Illinois gardening books. We have an Illinois gardening guide by John Frizzell. It's general gardening. It's not just the trees or shrubs. There's a little bit of native material, but it's a nice book all in all. And then we have Perennials for Illinois. This is a series of books, perennials, annuals, maybe a few other items, but it's William Ardrich. Neither one contained pawpaws. We're working that way. <laughs> then we have a general native plant one with the University of Extension. And it's just a very nice book, a um, lot of native information. Still no pawpaws. I found a book that did contain pawpaws, and it was uh, Trees, Shrubs, and Vines. And so we have a nice book that does get into the pawpaws. But I'm thinking that books are not the only choice. Maybe come to some of the local extension, get involved with some of the native prairie people to learn. Because if you find out what others are doing, you're gonna learn more than what the books are gonna tell you anyway. So you need to work beyond that. But references are great. And I do have pawpaws in my yard. Mm -hmm. I have a little pawpaw patch, which is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. And I found some, some neat things out. So anybody who needs, you can call me. Oh, you can call him, <laughs> call John. There's your resource. There's your resource right there. <laughs> okay. Well, now, next, we're going to go to Sue's question. What is the chemical to look for for killing Creeping Charlie? Can you share some product names? Yeah, boy, Creeping Charlie is just one of those things. I, I think a couple things is, with Creeping Charlie is, you know, it's a perennial, so the original plant comes back every year, obviously. Um, and so one of the things is, I, you know, it does make a nice ground cover, I must admit. So I have to be that person that says, you know, maybe sometimes it's nice to sort of, you know, makes a nice ground cover. Okay. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to look at a chemical, uh, generally they always list it as ground ivy. I don't know, I guess mm -hmm. Charlie doesn't like to be called a, by, you know, with a weed name or something. I don't know. So it's generally always listed as ground ivy, so that makes it a little bit confusing. Uh, generally, as far as chemicals, you're going to be looking at a combination product. So generally, it's going to be post-emergent, and it's usually going to have something like a 2,4-D and then another chemical in with it. So there'll be a couple of chemicals in there. Um, as far as product names, there's a bunch of them out there. Trimac might be one that you might you might think of that has several chemicals in it. I think the big thing with Creeping Charlie, if you are trying to get rid of it, is just the fact that, that generally a second application is needed. So always read and follow 
follow all label directions and when it tells you to reapply it or that you can reapply it then I would reapply because it, generally it's going to take two applications it's just one mm -hmm. of those that sometimes takes that and then also just to realize you may decide you want to live with it you know it's like the only thing that grows underneath my pine tree so I kind of like it for that reason and actually believe it or not the bees actually like it you know it's in the mint family and the bees like it so so you could put up with it in some, in some areas I you know places. I hate it in my strawberry patch and yes. I hate it in my flower garden areas but you know in some areas it actually works out pretty it nice smells so. good when you mow it. and it does smell good it is in the mint family so Half full and you can't right and you can't hardly kill it I well, mean how can you <laughs> if you want to kill it uh, a fall application yeah, that's another good thing and then a spring application when it's flowering if you're trying to kill something and it's in the flowering stage you're gonna get be a lot mm -hmm. more successful than you are at any right. other time so but a lot of the fall applications we don't think of. Yeah. Right, right, right. We have viewers ask about it and they call it Creepy Charlie. Creepy Charlie? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so true. Creepy Charlie. Okay, thank you for that question. Now, let's go to John's question. I would like to thank Diane and the group from, Di from WILL. We've had a wonderful day. My, my question is about asparagus. I have an asparagus patch in a raised bed with dimensions of, of four by eight. This is a third harvest. I have harvested sparingly the first two years. Last year I had a vigorous growth and growth that was dense and over five foot tall. In early winter when the ground was frozen, I cut the growth to the ground level, mulched with compost, and e even added some granular urea for added nitrogen. I was extremely disappointed this year when the growth was anemic. All but one of the roots shot up a few spears, and we were able to harvest enough for a few mills. Did I make a mistake in cultivating the asparagus? Could this be a disease issue? I have not noticed any vole activity. Do you have any suggestions? Okay. I'm going to take that one, and <clears throat> we have, uh, Sandy and I were talking, and we've seen about two or three, actually more than that, um, different asparagus patch that have been what I would call very anemic this year. I don't know why, whether it was the, the, the non-existence of winter basically, whether it needed that cycle, um, but <clears throat> from the sounds of everything that you say you've done, I don't know that, uh, that you did anything wrong. It wasn't the, uh, the urea may have been a little bit strong on the nitrogen level, uh, but you did mulch with um, uh, compost, so that would have put in the micronutrients that it needed and uh, you may want to let it grow one more year. I know they say th third year you can really start to harvest, but I think I would let it go one more year just to give it that chance to reinvigorate itself, and then hopefully we we'll, won't see the anemic growth for everyone next year. It's hard to wait. I know it is. <laughs> but then <clears throat> when it does start going, then you just think, why did I plant so much asparagus <laughs> now? Because I'm on like a 15th year. Well, I've seen somebody that's had a, huge. asparagus for 15, 20 years. Yeah. And this year, I, I, I noticed the same thing. There was very little asparagus growing. Yeah, We're yeah. trying to Mine establish did. new asparagus at Parkland, and it, w they're just wisp. They're little bitty pieces coming out. They're not so even doing well. this year is not but been... The cool, uh, I don't know, maybe the warm, cool, warm, cool could too be. much. Yeah. Could very well more, be. Yeah, more, more weather oriented than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's hopeful. And here, here it comes. Wait till next year. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, now let's go to Jane's question. Hi. Um, this is probably an age old question. I wondered if you have any good ideas on how to successfully keep squirrels and rabbits uh, from poaching all the peaches and berries. Um, my edibles, like uh, blueberries, red currants, gooseberries, strawberries, are mixed into the landscape. Uh, so it's not feasible to f put a wire fence around everything because they're all mixed in. Uh, and the squirrels have eaten through just about anything else I've tried, like netting. Um, it, it was hard for me to believe that there isn't such, somebody hasn't invented like a nice, attractive wired dome that you can put up over top of a raspberry shortcake blueberry or um, a jelly bean blueberry shrub that would look fairly nice and keep the squirrels mm -hmm. away from the berries. 
Sandy, that looks like a product you opportunity. Can make money. I know we can all make money. I know. I, I mean, squirrels are, are the hardest. I mean, they really are. If you think about it, I yeah. mean, rabbits and a lot of those we can actually do some pretty good job of fencing. But squirrels are really tough because you are you're actually going to have to have something over top too. Um, I don't know anything you know other than physical barrier like what you were just talking about. Unless anybody has some other ideas, I, I've had uh, you know. How do you feel uh, about uh, cayenne pepper on your blueberries? Does that, uh, that sound appealing to me to you at all? Around some things but you have to re reapply yeah, it and yeah. reapply it and yeah. reapply it and yeah so they yeah they're absolutely persistent so, the squirrels yeah. are pepper. and repellents are tough yeah so repellents are can work to some extent but you're absolutely right you have to reapply yeah. it um the other thing that i have seen listen i don't necessarily know if this works all that is actually to feed them somewhere else but to me that somehow encourages them to to have more babies and, and you have more squirrels and then they look. So I don't know about that, but I don't know if anybody's ever had uh, any success doing that kind of stuff. So I wish I had a great answer for you. And maybe this is that product opportunity that we could all think about and somebody could have done that. Anybody else got any other ideas? It's, it is an age old question because yeah. we just don't have a whole lot of options, unfortunately. Yeah. And, uh, well, the only thing yeah. that I, you know, if it's small enough, on small plants, actually what I do is those wonderful, you can get them at the, all the box stores and stuff where they have, like hardware stores, um, where they have the, um, they're, they're actually wire mesh baskets to put in like closets, mm -hmm. you know, those mm -hmm. closet areas. And I just flip them over onto mm -hmm. plants, but they're only, you know, about that tall. So it's, they work really good for small plants, but not that great for some of the bigger ones. But I've certainly used those and had pretty good success. Boy, something decorative would really be nice. I know. Huh. I know. There you Let's go. Look into there that. There you go, Diane. That's right. I do have a, a quite lethargic cat until oh. a squirrel comes into our oh. yard. <laughs> and this cat yeah. doesn't ever catch anything, yeah. but it does yeah. repel. And they do have those if you want. I don't know how much you want to invest in it, but you know they do have those motion sensor yeah. um, irrigation systems. You know, it's a mm -hmm. motion sensor thing, and it actually flips on some water, and it scares them away that way. But um, again, Boy, that's a little bit be, more investment. That'd be a wet garden. That'd this year. be a wet garden this year. You're right. <laughs> oh boy. But you know, sometimes it's getting them out of the habit. And I think that's part of the problem True. with wildlife is that they start getting into this habit of always coming to your yard or coming to a container or whatever, and and uh, yeah, got to break the habit. So we gave you the tough question. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Well, we just can't go by this show without showing a video, and we're all looking forward to seeing this little video clip from the first show. And welcome to the Illinois Gardener. I'm Jack Kelly. Tonight marks the premiere of Channel 12's new weekly gardening series. Whether you are an avid gardener or a novice, I think you'll find this program to be both entertaining and informational. Our goal is to provide you with the best advice on all aspects of gardening and lawn care. You know, you can do your garden and your world a lot of good by composting yard and other organic waste. Later in tonight's program, we'll show you the basics behind composting. But first, we want to hear from you. So give us a call at area code 217-333-3495. If you live outside our calling area, please call collect. And with me tonight to offer advice are Clifford Maskey of Maskey's Gardening, Doug Johnson of Greenview Nurseries, and Diane Nolan of the University of Illinois Department of Horticulture. I want to thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to start the program by going to some letters. <laughs> oh, you haven't changed a bit, Diane. Wasn't that sweet? That was so sweet. Aww. Yay! <laughs> Cut. <laughs> Okay, I've learned a lot from being on the show. Cut. <laughs> so, oh, that's funny. Jack Kelly was our yeah. host for seven years, mm -hmm. and he was quite a character, and I've been hosting for 18, so 25 years goes very fast. Well, before we go to the phone lines, we want you to know that we have several lines open, so if you want to ask a question on the 25th anniversary show, give us a call. All right, let's go to Richard's question on line two, and it's about Arborvita. Hi, Richard. Hey, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I, I got a row of arborvita planted, and they all look great except the two in the center. And the outside limbs of these shrubs are all leaned over and uh, almost touching the ground. The rest of them are up fine. I've got a neighbor who said, hey, you need to put some Epsom salt around that. I've never heard of such a thing. Have you, and can you help me with this? What's this problem? Why is they leaning over? So they look perfectly healthy, they're just leaning. 
Is that they is, look perfectly healthy? Yeah. Just the outside, the inside limbs are fine, but the outside limbs, just on the two uh, bushes, are leaning over and almost touching the ground. <coughs> well, a lot of arbor varieties are actually three trees mm -hmm. and not just one. So if you have three trunks there, they tend to split a little bit with the age and sometimes just tying them together near the top loosely so that they pulls them back together. Um, but as far as Epsom salt, I first I check drainage honestly. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, and it's one of those things. It's, it's sometimes it's listed for things like magnesium, which is an important thing that that plants need. But generally, it's not in not where they need it in high concentrations. And you would see other things. You would see poor growth. You'd see some other things that would indicate that it actually needed some magnesium, which is what you're going to get out of Epsom salt. So I, I, it's not going to hurt anything, but it's not something that we would recommend for that particular condition. You may find, you know, if you want to try and, and tie them up a little bit, you know, sort of temporarily to sort of get them. I don't know if you can do a little bit of pruning or I would just kind of wait and see. It's yeah. it's always, and it always seems like it's the ones in the center, right? It's not yes. the ones on the end. The most noticeable. It's the ones on the center that you really notice. So you may just want to sort of wait and kind of see if maybe they even, you know, grow together a little bit more as they grow or the other ones grow out and it's kind of fill like, in a little bit more. Check the drainage because if you have yeah. a drain line or something going right through there, that that's the Low spot. Especially this year with yeah, yeah. The extra with, watering. With it sounds like a had. lot of growth, and yeah. it's just yeah, it heavy. sounds like it, it may not have waiting. matured enough. To, to, it's just not strong enough to hold mm -hmm. it up, and mm -hmm. it's really growing. Yeah. So we're all waiting in on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'd wait and see. Yeah. I, and and you never want to apply anything without a soil test. No. Anyway, so. And I think mechanical. Magnesium is one of those things that tying. is a micro micronutrient, yeah. and it's not you. You would it's take a, a teaspoon and sprinkle it over the whole row, maybe, and that would be enough for the. And it's seldom deficient yeah. in the soils where you're growing yeah. shrubs. No. So that's what we think about the Harbor Vita <laughs> for now. Well, we're waiting for some phone calls, and uh, let's go to your one of your emails, Teresa, and then we'll go back to the phone lines. Okay. So my email. Uh, in order here. I had one on foxgloves, and I don't know if you guys noticed the IR day, we did see some beautiful mm -hmm. foxgloves. Mm. Foxgloves are unique in that they are biennial, that they take two seasons to actually grow to flower, and then they set seed once they flower, and they will often regrow from the new seed. So that on this question, um, he had foxglove that he grew last year, bought it in flower, it was beautiful, but it reseeded itself and it has four or five new plants. And he's wondering if those plants will bloom. They will bloom next year. So in order to get your cycle going so that they appear as if they're perennials, you plant some more foxgloves that are in flower, let them go to seed, and then each year you should have new seed coming and new foxgloves coming. But they do need that winter period in order to get them to actually go from the rosette up into a bolt and put the flower on. And after a while, you'll have all of that happening. Mm -hmm. You just yes. do it the first couple, two, couple three years. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're so, beautiful, mm -hmm. and they are beautiful. But you have to, you have to not be a neat gardener. If you cut back that flower head, you've lost those seeds for and the you next go, years. Go lighter on your pre-emerged seed killers too. Yeah. Oh, that's true. And it, a lot of times you won't know that they are you know, a foxglove and you'll be pulling up the little seedlings because they don't <laughs> so exactly look. Yeah, that's yeah. not good. I lost an entire batch of sweet woodruff and um, globe thistle one time with volunteers helping me. Oh. So oh, I didn't yeah. know they were going to help me and so I wasn't Oops. out there. But anyway, and, there so. and there are some new foxgloves that flower the first year from seed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there are some newer ones. And, and there are some perennials. Yeah. Fox gloves, they're not my favorite. But yeah, they don't have as big a flower, yeah. but they, they do flower the first year from the seed. So, so. so the fox glove story. All right, let's go to line three. Kathy has a question for us about cardinal flower. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I was reading, and I don't know if this is true, but I have cardinal flowers. This is our first year, and I wanted to know if they're um, poison and toxic because I have a dog and children. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard never, that. Never heard, um, never heard of it. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard that with that particular plant. Um, there's certainly some websites online you can actually go, especially if you're concerned about, you know, there are some things that are that are toxic to ant, to dogs and cats that aren't necessarily toxic to, to people. But I don't know that I've ever heard that before. 
But usually when it's toxic, you really you know hear it. it. Yeah, you and hear it. Um, I would never graze in my garden unless I really knew. Yeah. So it's probably not something that you want to, you know, encourage. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know that I know that. I mean, you so know, if you do have an animal, I think especially if you have a, a young dog or something that actually you know does a lot of chewing on stuff, it may be something you want to check on to be sure. But um, but we, no one's heard no. about that mm -hmm. on the panel, and it's a nice native. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, if you Great get plant. it to flower, it's really, yeah. you know, that is really doing something yes. right because it needs sun, moisture, well drained, and that's yeah. kind of hard. Yeah. To yeah. Have the hummingbirds all love them. Yeah, hummingbirds. Oh, and really it's a beautiful lovely. flower, red. Okay, so we're going to say no for that one. All right, let's go to Chris's question, line two about wisteria. Hi, Chris. Hello there. Um, I've had a wisteria bush for over 10 years at Zimmerman Arbor. It's quite healthy, and I feed it, and uh, it gets enough water, but it has never bloomed. Uh, any suggestions for how we can now, get you said on? feeding it. How much do you fertilize it? Mm, once a year with 10, 10, 10. And what time of the year? Um, in the, let's see, I'm trying to remember. I think in the spring. Okay. And how old is it? Ten, ten years. years. Ten years. I'd say uh, prune it. <laughs> well, uh, I've heard uh, to me, <laughs> you first you threaten them. First yeah. you threaten them. And you never fertilize one. And you never fertilize I them. Mean, you threaten them. But I would. Uh, until they're it very uh, wisteria is very precocious mm -hmm. in that there are some of the Japanese Chinese ones that I that I swear will never bloom. So my feeling is just. Give it up. Just after 10 years, uh, that's what I ended up doing with mine. I did everything what I thought was right. You're just supposed to prune them like grapes. You do a bunch of pruning. You don't for you don't fertilize all those things. I did everything, I, and they, the thing still didn't bloom. Um, I uh, ripped it out, and I got there's some nice new ones now. Um, Amasis Falls is a great one. I have that one. I'm trying to think. There's some other names, but there's some new ones. And actually, the nice thing about those is that they're actually they have an American heritage. They actually are with areas that are native to North America as opposed to the Japanese and Chinese that actually can be um, uh, can be invasive in mm -hmm. parts of the of the of the United States well, so it, I would just it, we're giving you permission just to if it's get a seed grown uh, wisteria and she's never seen it flower because if you uh, bought it already in flower that's one thing but if it was seed grown they say that it could take up to seven years, maybe ten, to find out if it's going to bloom. I don't have that kind of and patience. It's if it's going to bloom. If. Again. <laughs> if. If. Yeah. And if you want to make sure it's going to flower, buy it in flower. Yes. Yeah. And that's the nice thing. When I got my Amethyst Falls, it was in flower. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then you know it's going to flower. And, and I, I think it, the North American natives are so much better plants. Anyway. They are. They're much better, and, and the insects will, will benefit from them. The other thing is, if, if it was mine, I would wait one more year, but just... Oh, John, you're so nice. Prune it. I would prune, <laughs> prune it down nice. to, Walk by it. to uh, like that, Walk so that by and kick next it. year when it didn't flower, I didn't have that then much to take it. out. But, then um, threaten it. it threat, yeah, threaten it. <laughs> I'm saying. I do that all the time. My mine, mine bloomed twice last year. I got, you know, it did. It had the that. one that you cut back. The one that you yeah. cut back and everything. Okay. My, oh, my so there might. built a brand new garage and had Be to tear hope. off the uh, wisteria that was against the building. And so during the construction, it was not allowed to keep growing. Two years later, it came up and it's still thriving. Mm -hmm. So you so threatened you can, you can, it? Yeah, yeah you, you can't them. kill them. That's you fair. can't, yeah. Yeah. That I, wow. I would be like John. I would cut it back hard, hard. See, so you guys are much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was leaning towards your camp. But, you know, <laughs> so it's two to two. You make the After decision. After a while, it's. I don't think yeah. we've ever had a two After to two vote before. <laughs> You're out of okay, here. Okay, well, with two minutes to go, we're going to go to Mary Carol's question about bamboo on line five. Hi, Mary Carol. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I have a really, really challenge. Uh, bamboo trying to get it out of my garden mm -hmm. and um, I, it's invading my whole garden. I don't know what to do to get rid of it. Okay. Blow what torch? do you want to tell her? <laughs> <laughs> what, you Blow torch? <laughs> Blow torch? <laughs> yeah, what, depending on the variety, some of them are just totally aggressive and the only way I got rid of mine was actually getting in the ground and actually pulling mm -hmm. it up. Uh, every time I saw a new shoot come up, I would follow that, dig it up, and, and kind of follow, pull that root that maybe went from me down to the other end of the house. But um, 
they can be, I had one, I gave a plant to a, a, a friend of mine, he was a friend, and- uh, <laughs> No, he isn't now. And it actually penetrated his swimming pool and oh. went through thick plastic, which, and then it gushed out. And, Oh wow! No <laughs> kidding. It, 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 wanted, it wanted up, so they can yeah. be very, very aggressive. So the only real way is to is to be very aggressive and pull, pull, pull. Uh, you could. I don't. I don't know if any of the non-selective herbicides like uh, glyphosate, you know, found in Roundup and so those. If those are, if those would work, you'd have to do a spot application. You have to mm -hmm. be very, very careful. Read and follow the label directions, and just make sure you don't get it on anything you want to keep. But it, it at least with a product like that, it gets into the roots and can help you that way. But a lot of it is just that persistence of digging things up, and you may have to dig up your existing plants because they're probably intermingled right. in the roots, and that's what gets to be really tough. Yeah. So. Well, that's work too. Our sympathies. Yeah, and if you know where you've dug it, then don't let it cross that yeah. line because it may, once you dig it, it may keep going. So, yeah. oh boy, we feel bad <clears throat> about the bamboo. <coughs> well, we want to thank everyone for watching. Thank you, panelists and live audience. We're glad you're here. See you next time. Bye bye.